former allies now on opposite sides of a gun control debate at the Capitol today. And for the first time, we know how many Coloradans are expected to have their guns seized for safety reasons. It is now up to the governor whether our state opts to leave the Electoral College when we vote for president. Hey, speaking of, our politics guy Marshall Zellinger is at somebody's house in Iowa tonight because that's where our senator is doing what you do when you're running for president. The challenges of starting a small town police department from scratch. And artists are going to air their short stories on the side of buildings in the city. That's next. 170 Coloradans a year are expected to have their guns taken away temporarily. Democrats in the state legislature passed the red flag gun bill, which is being debated tonight as we speak. 170 people a year. That number is buried in a piece of financial paperwork that's associated with the bill, the red flag bill that would allow law enforcement, family or people in a gun owner's house to go to a judge and ask that judge to declare the gun owner a threat to themselves or others. Douglas County Sheriff Tony Spurlock, a Republican, is back this year backing the Democrats' red flag bill. He says the current law makes it too difficult to take guns from someone in crisis. The imminent danger thing doesn't work. I've said that before. I said it last year. I say it again. This bill helps us get through that because people that are in crisis and behavioral health that are in crisis, many times they flow in between those crises. When we know that, we can intervene. When the family members know that, we can intervene. And if we have the opportunity to do that, we can save a life. Specifically, Spurlock says they could have saved the life of Deputy Zach Parrish. He was killed by a mentally unstable man with guns. Parrish would have turned 31 today. Last year, Republican District Attorney George Brockler joined Sheriff Spurlock in supporting a red flag bill in Parrish's memory. This year, Brockler says he's opposed after the burden of proof got shifted to the gun owner. We've got to get the burden back on the person who's trying to infringe upon someone else's rights. I don't know anything else in our law that says you got to show up and prove to me, not by preponderance of the evidence, but by the highest standard in civil law that you deserve to get your rights back. So back to the numbers where we began. 170 Coloradans expected to have their guns taken away each year when judges deem them a threat. That estimate from the legislature is based on the rate of gun seizures in some of the other 13 states that have similar laws. But the rates of gun seizures vary significantly in those states. If Colorado's red flag law temporarily takes guns at the same rate as, say, California, well, then only 57 Coloradans would lose their guns each year. But in Maryland, these seizures happen much more often. That would result in 1,141 gun seizures a year in Colorado. Obviously, neither scenario is the wholesale disarming of the population, which critics fear. But those numbers vary pretty widely, and I think it's about time that some kind of numbers enter this emotional debate, a debate which continues at the Capitol as we speak. So it's up to Governor Polis now whether Colorado essentially opts out of the Electoral College and gives our state's electoral votes for president to the winner of the national popular vote. Democrats passed that bill through the legislature without a single Republican vote. There's a nationwide push by Democrats to shift America to a popular vote system, as opposed to the Electoral College, which gives outsized amounts of power to less populated states, states like Colorado. There are 11 other states in D.C. that are on board with this, but it would not take effect until states with 270 total electoral votes agree. Right now, they're at 181. Even if they reach that threshold, the switch would likely face legal challenges. And today, the Grand Junction Sentinel reports that elected leaders out of Mesa County and El Paso County have filed a referendum petition. They want to force this idea onto the ballot so you could vote on what to do with your vote. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger is on the road for us. He's following former Governor John Hickenlooper on his Don't Call It a Campaign Trail, a political show that now features Colorado's Democratic Senator Michael Bennett as well. Iowa has four letters. Hick has four letters. Bennett, if you take out the repeats, has four letters. Colorado's Democratic Senator Michael Bennett and former Governor John Hickenlooper will be on opposite sides of Iowa this weekend. Iowa presidential aspirations. Bennett starts on the east side of the state, a Thursday night house party in Dubuque. Then we'll hit the road on Friday for a three-hour drive with my own personal pit stop in Marshalltown. 
before seeing the senator again in Johnston and Waukee. On Saturday, we'll get to see how the western half of Iowa compares. Hickenlooper takes his not-quite-ready-to-announce tour on a foodie trip of the state. It starts at a coffee shop in Sioux City, then a tavern in Carroll, and he'll end with a popular soup dinner in Ames. Just imagine how much of the state they'll want to see if they were actually running for president. Marshall joins us live now from the front lawn of some lady's house in Dubuque, Iowa. <laughs> Senator Michael Bennett has just arrived in the neighborhood. He was greeted by that gorgeous hand-drawn yard sign and handed a name tag. Marshall, I suppose this means that his name recognition struggles are real. Uh, hey, they spelled his name right. I figured Bennett might be difficult to spell if you're not familiar with him, where I might have trouble spelling Dubuque. I'm outside while the senator is speaking inside because just picture any suburban home in Centennial, Littleton, Parker, you name the city. If I'm in the kitchen trying to do a live report like this and you're in the living room trying to sell yourself on maybe I'm going to run for president, it might be distracting. So I stepped outside. Photojournalist Corky Scholl is inside and shot some video about 30 minutes ago when Michael Bennett arrived, the senator arrived, and got the fanfare you'd expect from a couple people right in the doorway. There's about maybe a dozen and a half, two dozen people inside right now. He got a button to put on right away. As I mentioned, his name is spelled correctly, so there's a plus. And it's not cliche yet, but it might become cliche. They have all queued up, ready to go. That Senate floor speech, I'm assuming, is Bennett v. Cruz from a few weeks ago when Senator Michael Bennett realized he might now have name recognition to run for president. The rest of the uh, event right now inside the House is answering questions and meeting and greeting in his first stop in Iowa, Kyle. Scintillating stuff, Marshall, but this is how politics is done. Travel safely across Iowa, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Hey, did you hear those helicopters last night? A lot of people told us they heard the helicopters. So it was the Army. Choppers out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, doing some high altitude and urban training in our neighborhood, and we're told they will be in our skies through Sunday. Across America, at least one in four drunk drivers is a repeat offender. Colorado created a law in 2015 to make a fourth DUI a felony. Our nine wants to know team reviewed convictions and found that Coloradans continue to again and again get caught for the same thing. They're still drinking and they're still driving. Fire a stray bullet into the air and it might just come down and hit someone. People who drive drunk in many ways fire into the air, not with guns, but with cars, turning those cars into stray bullets that kill 30 people every day in the United States. Sometimes only the driver dies. Sometimes it's a passenger or a neighbor or a random person walking down the street. Drunk drivers kill people in Colorado. People like Angela Wimmer, who was sitting at a stoplight coming home from church, and Sancy Shaw, who died on Christmas Eve. Both killed, police say, by drivers with histories of driving drunk. Since 2015, prosecutors have filed more than 4,000 felony DUI charges each involving a driver convicted of at least three prior DUIs. We examined those convicted and found not all go to jail or prison. About a third avoided that penalty, instead receiving community corrections or probation. More than 180 got another chance, a deferred sentence. Since the passage of the felony DUI law, we found 116 drivers convicted of multiple felony DUIs. Some still drinking, still driving, and getting caught four, five, six, or even 10 times. The new law was supposed to bring down drunk driving wrecks. Statistically speaking, it hasn't. At least three Coloradans were killed by those who would go on to be convicted of felony DUI. Those three men were caught again and again, still drinking, still driving. Stray bullets that eventually hit someone. Consider what happened at the Colorado State Capitol today, a metaphor for every single effort to fix our expensive health care system. Everybody there admits it's a problem, can't agree on how to fix it. Chris Vanderveen, our resident medical bill guy, is back to continue his Lean on Me investigation. Yeah, I assumed it was some kind of mistake. Yet mistakes. How is this fair? It's, it's not. Mistakes, these were not. We lost. And we lost. Leans on homes owned by patients who did everything. What is my alternative? Bad. Everything right. We found more than 170 filed in the last two years alone. In recent Nine News investigation, journalists contacted people with judgment liens from medical debt. 
every single person they talked to went to an in-network hospital and unknowingly saw an out-of-network provider. Thursday, the very same committee that killed Representative Carrie Tipper's last bill related to medical debt. It's just a little bit of a deja vu being in front of you today. Heard about her new bill that seeks to eliminate property liens for medical debt. That is terrifying. It is the roof over your head. It is the only security that you have. Let's just say the same debt collectors that fought her a few weeks ago came back. We believe this bill's just far too reaching. With virtually the same arguments. That's where I think the bill is unfair. House Bill 1145 is a bit complicated, but it seeks to protect patients from liens that could potentially lead them to lose their homes. Liens like the ones we found scattered all over the Denver metro area. Collectors and providers say they occasionally need liens to ensure payment. That's our only way of getting our doctors paid. In the end, sensing yet another victory for the debt collectors, Representative Tipper did this. I would uh, appreciate the opportunity to work on this bill a little bit more. She pulled her bill. For now, it could come back later, but clearly it's not receiving the reaction she had hoped to see. For next, this is Chris Vanderveen. Even if this doesn't come back, the legislature is going to take up another issue that was raised in Chris's reporting, surprise medical bills. Legislation on that issue has not made it out of committee for years. It's going to have a real chance to do that in a couple of weeks. I thought what a neat experience to be able to start your own police department. And every single officer is getting severance pay. That was a terrible pun on my part. The town of Severance is finally getting its own police department. After all, who can say they've started their own police department? And on this throwback Thursday, one viewer looks back to the days when, well, people with real talent sat in this chair. Plus, artists in Colorado find an unusual venue to showcase their films, the sides of buildings. That's next. Here we go again, another round of cold and snow and then a wonderful weekend warm up. This low pressure system bringing snow down to sea level in Southern California is headed for Colorado and then into the Midwest where it will be just a nasty mess for travelers. Tonight we'll be dealing with some areas of fog, freezing rain, even flurries after a day with highs just barely above freezing. Another cold day coming up tomorrow with heavy snow really ramping up in the Southern mountains. Winter weather and travel advisories already out. Denver will see a band of snow come through late 
the day into the evening on Friday with about one to three inches possible by Saturday morning, and then the whole pattern shifts. There are advisories for blowing snow on the eastern plains, and we'll be measuring the snow in feet in the southern mountains. Tonight, flurries and freezing fog. Yuck, cold low of 16. Tomorrow, mostly cloudy, 31. Afternoon snow, snow for the evening drive, but a warming trend for the weekend with highs back in the 40s, 50s possible early next week. And always download the 9 News weather app when a storm is looming. And Kyle, isn't a storm always looming? Is that a QAnon joke? I'm not sure. Thank you, Kathy. Weld County Sheriff's deputies have been the law in severance for years. This year, though, severance has taken the law into its own hands. Here's Noel Brennan. It used to be a small town. Used to be. The elevation. Now it's way too big for me. Once topped the population. Down at the corner, they had a sign that said severance population like 103. Those were the days mm -hmm. in severance. That was counting two dogs and a, and a cat. So while it's nice, some things never change. Post office has always been here. Bruce's bar. The perk of growing pains is getting something new. I guess it would be the police department. The very first police department. Misty Sitterfin is chief of police. Yes. By default, chief of creative. Creating the badge, creating a patch. And chief of equipment. We're looking for work boots. <laughs> Her whole department fits in one office. It's pretty odd, actually. <laughs> Five of seven are women. I am a severance police officer. Focused on service, not stereotypes. Women have as much capability as men to do this job. They're good at multitasking. They're good problem solvers, and um, they're really good at talking to people. I've never had to fight anybody into handcuffs. Officers will keep busy as severance booms. We have a ton of new developments going in. But they'll still answer those small town calls. But it sounds like somebody called in a baby hawk that is on the ground and like can't fly. It's not an emergency, but it's in the road and we would hate for it to get hit. It won't always be easy to wear the badge. And the baby was gone, but there was some blood on the road. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, thanks. thanks. Bye. Bye. How horrible. <laughs> no matter how big the town grows, houses, wall to wall houses. Finally, there's a department. It's on the southern end. Serving severance. It's going to be a struggle at times and frustrating at times, but also amazing. For next. One, two, three, break. <laughs> Woo Let's go. I'm Noel Brennan. Chief says she's looking to hire a school resource officer come spring. It's her goal within five years to have 10 officers in the severance police department. On this throwback Thursday, in the middle of reunion week on 9 News, our, our viewer David Yulane is reminding us of his old memories of 9 News from 1985. Dug up this letter telling him that he had won a car that we were giving away. How do you like that thing right there? David calls it his super sweet Renault Encore. Unfortunately, the car was total in a crash. Still has that note from Ed Sardella, so uh, that's good. David's the guy in the stylish Argyle sweater there next to the white car. Nine News giving away cars in 1985. Woo, we were flush. Hope you've caught some of our former colleagues, though, as some of our forever friends as they come through on the morning show this week telling us what they are up to today. Kyle Dyer was a ray of sunshine this morning. It was good to see her. Check it out if you haven't. An unusual art project providing a sort of tour of the city. Tons of people are going to get to see it. It's a, a canvas that is totally new to me. Art project providing a sort of tour of the city. And it's a sign that this trail isn't for everyone. Next.
there and nearly got caught on camera again, I'm telling you. We've taken tours of the city's street art, the can't miss murals that cover whole sides of buildings. We've taken you to the small tongue and cheek pieces that are tucked away where you have to be looking at them to get the joke. And a lot of that art is paint. Rhino is about to bathe itself in light and film. Free to see for everybody in view. Moving pictures made by Colorado's digital artists. You, know, you can look for them starting on Friday, March 1st. I am so excited about what I'm going to be showing at Side Stories. My name is Lottis Feliciano, and I'm a filmmaker, an animator, um, an artist, um, and my work is what I call moving collage. The space that I animated in is, is really just that cylindrical space that you see over there. I like feel like a kinship with it now. <laughs> no pun intended, but we're kind of siloed into our phones. Um, and really experiencing it that way. And this is a way to experience digital artwork collectively, together. People who maybe aren't as willing to venture into a gallery or a museum setting or whatever it may be are able to find this work, see it, and maybe find some something that they love about it. My name is Brian Fui. I tend to go by Fui. Um, I'm a photographer mostly. For side stories, I decided to take a theme of uh, bedtime stories, and I'm calling it Goodnight Denver. At the end of the day, just having my work out there for anyone to see is a win. As a creative district, one of the goals has to be to allow our artists to ongoing make a good living and stay here. I mean, it enriches the entire city. On the Side Stories website, organizers have built an interactive map so that you can find each film. They'll also post audio clips of each artist explaining the work so you can listen to that while you watch. We return with a sign that we need to live within our limits and some of your feedback tonight is on a sore subject. It's a sign that Colorado's trails 
are not made for your semi truck. You honestly would not think this would be necessary on the Muddy Creek Trail near Frazier and that bridge, which appears to be just, I don't know what, like four boards stuck together for hikers and mountain bikers and maybe the occasional ATV. But don't try bringing your tractor trailer through here, buddy. The weight limit is 40 tons. Thanks to our viewer, Patricia, who got a smile out of that weight limit sign, wanted to share the feeling. Send your signs to next at 90s.com or get our attention with the hashtag hey next. Joe says your Hickenlooper trail graphic reminded me of dying of dysentery on the Oregon Trail. Oh, Joe, you just wait and see what graphic we've got coming up soon on that. Tom, Doug, Robert, all right in wondering what in the world is going on with my thumb tonight. You ever wonder what happens if you're working with a chisel and a mallet and you slip? I don't wonder anymore. See you next time.